Welcome and thank you for joining the fourth episode of ISIL webinar series 2020. My name is Safira from the Indonesian Society of International Law. Today we are going to talk about how to pursue a career in International Court of Justice. For this topic, we have invited our distinguished speaker, Bang Gelardi Nurbintoro. Good afternoon, Bang. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Bang, for sparing your time for us. Um, now, if I may have Bang Gulardi CP uh, with us. Okay. Uh, Bang Gulardi is currently working at the Directorate of Legal Affairs and Territorial Treaty under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, for this webinar, specifically, Bang Gulardi will talk about how he has pursued his career uh, as a judicial clerk at ICJ in 2017-2018. Our hope at the end of this webinar is that um, all audiences would know what and uh, how to prepare themselves later uh, at working at ICJ. Uh, so please bear with us until the end of this session. Uh, before we begin, we would remind uh, audiences that if you have any questions about this topic, please do submit it to the question box below. Uh, however, we need to inform you that um, we would not be able to discuss any, any issues relating to the decision-making process of the judges at the ICJ. Um, this session, okay, sorry. Uh, this session would focus on three points. Uh, first, uh, the student life of Bangalardi at University of Indonesia. Uh, second, his career as a diplomat and his postgraduate education before becoming a clerk at ICJ, and third, the Judicial Fellowship Program at ICJ. Uh, now going directly to the first point, Bang. Yeah. Uh, when you were still a law student at University of Indonesia, what makes uh, international law appeals to you more than other uh, area of law? Or what sparks your interest in learning international law in the first place? So uh, first of all, at the outset, I would like to thank the Indonesian Society for International Law for inviting me uh, for this uh, webinar session. Uh, it is an honor to be invited to this session. And uh, I would like to address immediately now the uh, question uh, asked. Um, I grew up in a rather an international environment, actually. So my father works also at a foreign ministry. So I have been living in various places already since I was a kid. And uh, it uh, sparked uh, the, my interest in international relations. Uh, basically, when I was uh, in junior high school, I have been always interested in international politics and also politics in general. And then uh, when I was in high school, uh, my parents suggested to me to take law because uh, they said there is international law that you can study. So basically, I picked inter uh, the law school uh, based on the suggestions from my parents. And uh, I knew from the very first beginning that uh, I would like to uh, study international law. However, I did not uh, have, I didn't know back then uh, which area of international law I would be pursuing. And uh, in the third semester, uh, I participated in, in, uh, in a general public lecture by Ambassador Hashim Jalal. And he talked about how Indonesia struggle in uh, getting the acknowledgement from the international community on the archipelagic state concept was finally adopted under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, and it was really remarkable how he uh, was able to persuade me particularly and also inspired me uh, on the importance of law of the sea. So since then, I knew that uh, I would like to study uh, international law, particularly law of the sea. And also because inspired by Ambassador Hashim Jalal, I immediately knew that uh, I wanted to do my master's as well as my SJD at the University of Virginia because that's where pa Hashim also studied. Okay, um, now uh, before we go further into your uh, master's in law and also as yeah. at University of Virginia, yeah. we want to know more about your activity at mm -hmm. University of Indonesia first. Yeah. So um, did you join any non-academic activities like mood court or, 
uh, what's your advice to our audiences that are still in university? Should they also uh, try this kind of activity or it doesn't matter if you want to pursue a career in uh, ICJ that doesn't really need to be done? Well, to me, international law, mood, I mean, moot court is an academic activity to some extent for me, even though it's uh, outside the, uh, the uh, formal, let's say, uh, classroom. Uh, it is uh, one of the organizations that I joined during my uh, time at UI, and uh, I was really grateful uh, to have participated in the organization because I have to make clear here that I did not uh, really, I was not really uh, confident of my own ability to actually participate in the competition itself, but uh, I've got to uh, participate in the workshop, so I got a uh, quite a number of uh, knowledge that I could gain from participating in workshops organized by the International Law Mode Court Society. And also, obviously, uh, aside from the uh, academic uh, endeavor, so to say, uh, there are all, I, have, uh, I have made uh, good friends uh, out of, uh, uh, of this uh, organization in some of which uh, I think will be the speaker tomorrow, Hannah and also Winchen. Uh, I've known them uh, as my good friends since I, I was in UE. And uh, I think uh, for those of you who are interested in international law, uh, it's good to participate in, uh, in the uh, Moot Court Society, in Moot Court uh, competitions. Uh, obviously, it will uh, train your ability to think uh, quickly because uh, in moot courts, judges will ask you direct questions and you have to answer it uh, immediately. Uh, and so uh, there are a number of uh, advantages of joining the uh, organization, of participating in moot court competitions. And uh, I think uh, it is important, but from my own experience, even though you don't uh, participate in such uh, competitions, uh, it does not mean that your uh, chances of being able to to uh, advance in the later stages of your life in your career will diminish just because you don't participate in in moot court competitions but it's good it's good yeah. um okay so that for um non-academic active uh, activities outside academic now do you think that getting a good gpa or ipk matter uh, when you were in university of indonesia uh, well, uh, I have, I've heard uh, some seniors of mine, well, it depends actually, first of all, if you want to pursue your career in public uh, service, let's say in the government like me, then the government sets a minimum requirement of GPA. That is for me, for undergrad, back then in 2010, it was 2.75. I don't know, uh, for this year, probably it's at 3.0. So you have, if you want to work for the foreign ministry, then your standard should be at least around 2.75 or 3.0. But if you want to pursue later on uh, to work in a, in a law firm, let's say, I don't think that law firms uh, really have a strict requirement of GPA. Uh, I think they prefer more uh, your uh, participations in moot court competitions, I think, uh, because uh, it is more of a credential rather than the GPA because sometimes people with high GPA uh, does not it does not necessarily mean that uh, they are able to uh, think like a lawyer so to say uh, but it does not I mean it does not really guarantee with high GPA but if you want to work for the government then there is a minimum requirement for it and you should pursue for at least 2.75 or 3.0. And that, that is actually what I did. And uh, uh, my GPA, my, when I was in my undergrad, was also not really remarkable. It's still, uh, it was just enough for me to, uh, to submit my application to the foreign ministry. Okay, Bang. Uh, thank you. Uh, now you've graduated from University of Indonesia in 2010. And now yeah. after that, you work at the foreign ministry. Yeah. Uh, before you involve before your involvement as a judicial court at ICJ, mm -hmm. uh, you have a lot of experiences at the Foreign Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mm -hmm. You are also a member of Indonesian delegate for bilateral yeah. meeting. Yeah. Could you tell us more on these experiences? 
And mm -hmm. do you think that, that these experiences have helped you uh, shape your goal at ICJ? Well, uh, to be honest, if you, will, if you want to talk about my uh, ICJ, I, I only knew about the judicial fellowship opportunities when I graduated from uh, UVA in 2014 for my master's because my classmate, uh, there was an announcement in, on, in, the, in the law school's website that my classmate got accepted at the ICJ for the Judicial Fellowship, and she was going to clerk for Judge uh, Benuna uh, in 2014. And uh, so when I entered the foreign ministry, I haven't set my eyes on the ICJ. I, and uh, that was, to me personally, uh, my first setback, if I may say, and uh, my first realization of how the government works, actually, because I expected when, as a person with a law school degree, uh, I expected to be put into the uh, legal department immediately. But uh, instead, I was um, ordered to be in the uh, Directorate for South American and Caribbean Affairs, which is very far away from, from any legal issues. And I didn't handle any legal issues when I was there. So it was more bilateral relations uh, with the South American and Caribbean countries, uh, which I enjoyed doing it, uh, but I would have enjoyed it more if I had the opportunity to work on law issues, law re legal related issues. However, uh, I was quite fortunate that during that time I had my very supportive director and also my deputy director who had given me immediate opportunities, uh, immediate permission to apply for the law school. So uh, I used my time uh, during my first years in the in the foreign ministry to actually uh, apply for my scholarship as well as for my uh, LLM to UVA. And uh, uh, my only goal was that was then to uh, enhance my knowledge in law of the sea. I haven't set my uh, goal for ICJ yet in, in 2012 when I applied. I see. Okay, well, uh, so after you uh so you worked uh, before you went to university of virginia mm -hmm. to take masters of law you were in um the directorate for south american and caribbean affair if i'm yes. not mistaken yes um maybe uh, let's start with uh your education at university mm -hmm. of virginia mm -hmm. so candidates of judicial fellowship uh, mm -hmm. This is based on my research, and mm -hmm. you may clarify uh, after yeah. this. Uh, candidates of Judicial Fellowship Program or University Traineeship Program mm -hmm. at ICJ are nominated or sponsored mm -hmm. by selected universities with uh, good reputations of international law studies, meaning that uh, not all universities can nominate their candidates to the ICJ. Um, yeah. There are several nominating universities like Virginia, Harvard, Yale, NYU, Columbia, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, you said previously that uh, you haven't set your uh, thought to ICJ prior to uh, being in the University of Virginia. Could you tell us more about uh, that and why uh, you made your choice to mm -hmm. take master's in the University of Virginia? So. Okay, I'll start from the very first. Uh, why I chose, uh, I, 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 I mentioned earlier that uh, my goal was to have to do my master's and my SJD at UVA because I was inspired by Ambassador Hashim Jalal. So that was my sole uh, reason to go there. And, uh, uh, and uh, Virginia, of course, is one of the leading uh, law schools in the world uh, in terms of uh, uh, the specialities in in law of the sea if you look at the uh, if you study law of the sea you will see that uh, there is a commentary to the uh, united nations convention on the law of the sea which is called the virginia commentary because actually virginia uh, professors uh, compile all the documents relating to the negotiation process of of uh, the uh, un conference on the law of the sea which make them uh, able to produce seven volumes of the commentary. So that is my uh, most uh, important uh, reason why I chose Virginia. And uh, when I was, when I, well, when I graduated from my LLM, uh, as I have informed you earlier, uh, my classmate 
uh, got accepted as a as a clerk as a university trainee back then it was called uh, for for judge benuna at the icj so i tried to find out uh, what 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 this clerkship is all about and in my first year of my sjd i i knew that uh, it has a very uh, strict requirement of having to be able to speak english and french so i brought the case to uh, my professor and said uh, professor this is quite unfair for those people who are coming from countries like indonesia because uh, let alone french uh, our english is not uh, our first language even for myself uh, i'm even until today sometimes i feel i'm not really confident with my english uh, ability and uh, so how can i compete with the other other people uh, who are able to to speak uh, english and french and uh, those are mostly coming from the uh, countries from the western hemisphere and uh, and uh, the next year they uh, didn't make it a strict requirement to that anymore and uh, so they only make it as a it, it would be a preference it, it would be good if if you can speak the other official language of the court and uh so i started to i started to uh set up my uh i my goal to be accepted as a clerk at the icj i started to publish uh short articles opinions uh in newspapers uh, to train my uh, ability in uh, conducting research as well as writing uh, papers. And I managed to publish an article, I think in 2016, in the Indonesia Law Review, it was co-authored. Uh, I was writing about the uh, biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And I think uh, the process of writing a journal uh, in the case, I think uh, it, it, uh, it helped me uh, a lot in, in uh, advancing my goal to get to be accepted at the ICJ. And uh, the universities that are participating in uh, ICJ Judicial Fellowship Program, uh, as you said, Harvard, Yale, uh, UVA, NYU, Columbia, uh, mostly are from the United States and Europe, and then also from NUS. And then sometimes there are universities from India or uh, from China. Uh, these universities have to undergo like an agreement with the court that they will find that will once the candidates are accepted they will be able to fund the candidates for the whole one year process and I think this is a uh, quite a, a challenging requirement for some universities especially in Indonesia because imagine for a university to finance for example around fifty thousand uh, dollar for one person uh, which I think fifty thousand dollars can be used can be utilized for renovating a classroom, for example, in Indonesia. And uh, so, I, uh, as as of today, I, I haven't seen any Indonesian university participating in in such a judicial fellowship program. Although it is possible for any university to apply. Uh, you mentioned earlier about publishing um, books and writing articles mm -hmm. about international law. Mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us about the selection process in mm -hmm. UP, University of Virginia? Okay. Uh, how many candidates were nominated uh, from University mm -hmm. of Virginia at your time? Yeah. And how did you uh, get to be nominated by University of Virginia? So uh, every university has their own uh, selection process. Uh, at UVA, the selection process is simply based on the documents. Some other universities, they conduct interviews and really trying to uh, examine your uh, international law knowledge based on the interviews while at uva uh, we are only required to submit uh, basic documents like uh, our uh, how do you call it the, the our grades and then also we have to submit publishable uh, uh, article so we have to write another journal basically that is uh, of publishable quality and uh, basically that's that's the requirement there is no interview and so on so uh in during my year i think there were six people applying for the judicial fellowship and the uva every year they only select two people so one as a principal candidate and the other one as a alternate candidate 
they, they submit the names to the court and the court will then choose uh, the candidates, which one they will, uh, they will uh, select. And then uh, they will get back to the university, they will inform the university about the selection of the court, and then the court will inform the candidate whether they accept it or not. And then, yeah, the process is just a matter of administrative matter. And it is uh, unique uh, in every law school. Some law schools submit four names. UVA only submit two names usually. And uh, it doesn't actually really matter how many names they submit because uh, at the court, uh, they will only pick one name, one candidate from one university. Mm -hmm. So let's say if someone from Harvard who submits five, four names, uh, is being picked already by one judge, then the rest three will automatically be eliminated. Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, now, uh, I want to talk about your involvement in the Directorate of um, South American and Caribbean Affairs. So you mm -hmm. were there from 2012 mm -hmm. until 2014. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, you're also taking an L LLM at University of Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. My question would be um, how to be an excellent study with those a busy schedule. So, uh, well, uh, then one, one thing that I have to uh, correct, why I put 2012 until 2014, because as a matter of administrative purposes, I was still under the directorate. But when I did my LLM, I was completely uh, focusing on my uh, on my studies, so I was not given any any job, any work uh, related uh, matters when I was at uh, doing my LLM. So administratively, I was under the directorate of legal uh, of South American and Caribbean Affairs during my LLM, but mm -hmm. uh, I was relieved of my uh, obligations to work uh, for the foreign ministry. So I didn't have any problem uh, balancing uh, work and uh, studies. Let's see, okay. Um... Well, let's talk about um, the courses you took when you were in University of Virginia. So mm -hmm. you took uh, John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, as well as the Road Academy of Ocean Law and Policy in Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly that? And do you think that uh, for some of us who wants to pursue a career in ICJ should also um, follow your footsteps? So uh, the John Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies short course was a compulsory short course uh, when I took my LLM through, my, through the scholarship of the United States Indonesia uh, Society. So they made it a requirement for any Indonesian uh, participants uh, uh, to actually it's a three weeks uh, short course on English language basically. So it's not really um, a short course on law. But in 2015, I uh, participated in the Rhodes Academy uh, because uh, it is uh, UVA, University of Virginia, is one of the uh, sponsors of the uh, Academy. And uh, it's a very uh, enlightening uh, three weeks uh, in Greece, uh, where the first week you get to have a basic uh, lecture on UNCLOS. And then the second week, you will be it will be go, it will go deeper into the maritime boundary delimitation issues, and then the environmental issues, and then there is an exam at the end of the short course. Uh, what really uh, I think Rhodes Academy is very uh, beneficial for those who want to pursue uh, knowledge in the law of the sea, uh, because the lecturers are judges from ITLOS mainly and also uh, really well-known professors. And not only the lecturers, but also the participants, they have a very advanced experience and career already. So you, cannot, uh, you can learn not only from the lecturers, but also from the participants. And this is truly enriching for me. And uh, for anyone who wants to study Law of the Sea, I think uh, it is the best a short course in, in Law of the Sea, the Rose Academy. And obviously, uh, when your knowledge in Law of the Sea is quite advanced, I think it will help you to, to get into uh, the, inter for, for being selected to the International Court of Justice because uh, the ICJ have abundant of maritime boundary delimitation cases. I see, okay. Um... 
uh, let's now move on to yeah. the Judicial Fellowship Program at yeah. ICJ. Yeah. So given the long process that it took for you to join this program, mm -hmm. you have to go through LLM and SJD. Do you think that it would be possible uh, for you to be accepted at ICJ uh, without uh, your education background from uh, University of Virginia? Uh, quite, I mean, I, I, I don't think so, quite unlikely. Because uh, even when I look at my colleagues who participated, I mean, who got accepted uh, for the Judicial Fellowship, it, uh, they have tremendous experience which, in which, uh, which I envied them. And they are very advanced in terms of knowledge as well as experiences in, in, in the field of law. Uh, so I think in order to, because the selection process is very competitive, I think there is no other way than to uh, advance your knowledge and also your experience uh, at, uh, you know, in the later stage of your career. I don't, I'm not saying that you have to go to UVA because there are other law schools that are actually participating in, in, the, in, the, in the judicial fellowship, but certainly, uh, if you uh, the, the the schools that are participating in the uh, judicial fellowship program are those schools who have the resources in terms of money who can finance you and mostly they are from the Ivy League uh, universities. Mm -hmm. The those univer the other universities that do not have the resources they may not participate. And when your school is not participating, then you cannot uh, you cannot apply. Obviously, I mean. If UVA did not participate in the judicial fellowship program, then I cannot apply through the Harvard Law School, for example. It, it's not it's impossible. So uh, you have to uh, find out first which law schools uh, are actually participating in the program in order to enable your chance to be accepted as a judicial fellow at the court. Okay. Uh, so can you now explain to us what is judicial fellowship program? So basically, this judicial fellowship program started in... 2000, I think when the president of the court was uh, Judge Schwebel. Uh, of course, uh, he's an American, and in the United States, there is a strong tradition of clerkship. Uh, um, maybe some of you have heard that uh, the judicial clerkship at the U.S. Supreme Court is such a prestigious clerkship, uh, and once you get accepted, it's like you are passing the New York bar. It's like you are passing the New York bar again if you are getting accepted as a law clerk at the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. So the, Judge Schwebel has this idea to uh, bring some law students to help the judges because uh, until then, it was only the legal department who provided the judicial assistance to the judge. And it was uh, possible before because uh, I think uh, there were some periods uh, in the history of the court in which there are not many cases. But I think after 1980s, 1990s, the number of cases really quadrupled and uh, uh, the judges need more uh, legal assistance. I mean, not, not in the sense that they don't understand the law, but of course, in order to conduct the research and so on. So. Uh, Judge uh, Schwebel proposed this program and uh, asked the NYU initially to send five uh, students uh, to help uh, the judges. And uh, because there were 15 judges, so these uh, five individuals, they are helping three judges at the same time. And uh, over the course of the, uh, over the, the course of the program of the years, uh, it evolved and now each judge has one judicial fellow. And on top of that, uh, the, United uh, the United Nations has allocated a budget to finance uh, another law clerks that are hired uh, by the ICJ and being paid by the United Nations uh, as a P2 in the P2 level. That is uh, 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 the official title is Associate Legal Officer. And uh, they are uh, in the for a two years contract at the court, which can be extended for another two years, so maximum four years working for one particular judge. So one judge has one clerk, so to say, uh, who is being hired by the United Nations, and then another clerk as a judicial fellow in which I was uh, uh, participating in. 
Okay. Um, you said earlier that this program is competitive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how, why do you think you are admitted or selected by ICJ? I, I, I really don't know why actually, okay. <laughs> but uh, Maybe you can give us tips and tricks. Of but I think th this is the thing. Uh, I think, uh, you know, in life, there is a factor of luck. And I think I was lucky on that time, maybe because uh, probably uh, during that time, I did manage to publish uh, an article in, in a journal. So it added value to my CV. And also maybe on that time, uh, my credentials are something that the judge really needed for that time. Maybe they didn't need my expert experience if I participate in the next year, for example. So it was a matter of uh, luck. It was a matter of uh, proper timing, which we cannot actually control. And so uh, I have always difficulties in answering such questions because I really don't know what is actually the, what the judge is actually uh, looking for because each judge has, its, uh, has his or her own preferences and the, their working methods are also unique to each other. And uh, so there is no clear cut answer to that. But for the requirement for, for example, uh, for the school uh, requirement, mm. of course you can set the standard from there. For example, you have to publish at least one article. You have to show that you really have this knowledge in international law. You have to show, for example, that you have experience in moot court that support the your cv that uh, okay i have a basic understanding or even advanced understanding of international law that uh, could be useful for the court because when you are there you are actually assisting the court it will help the court if you don't have if you only have rudimentary knowledge of international law that's that's what i'm saying okay uh now, Bang, uh, yeah. we already have 13 questions from the floor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to read some of the questions. Yeah. Um, so, do we have to be graduated from an IP League school to work in the ICJ? I think mm -hmm. that has been answered. Yeah. Um, it depends with the university, whether it's yeah. a nominate. Uh, so, you guys uh, need to look into the information mm -hmm. about the university before uh, applying to that there. Uh, second, are there any tips or tricks to pursue a career on the ICJ, specifically as a judge? This is a good question if you want to. As a judge? Yes, as a judge. Okay. So, uh, so I'm working for uh, Judge Shui, who currently is the vice president of the court. And uh, uh, she was also a diplomat. She works at the Chinese Foreign Ministry. And... Uh, and uh, she was also the uh, first Chinese ambassador to ASEAN and also the, uh, the Chinese ambassador to the Kingdom of Netherlands. So uh, maybe when she sees my background, uh, she gave an opportunity for me to, uh, to be able to, to work at the court. And speaking uh, of uh, how to develop a career at the ICJ as a judge, basically, if uh, what all the judges are basically saying is you have to publish a lot. You have to write articles and to write articles are not merely uh, articles in newspapers because in the academic setting, it does not carry so much weight. You have to publish in articles in journals. So it has to be purely academic articles. Otherwise, uh, people will not be uh, able to justify you as a, as a judge. I'm, I'm talking now for a career as a judge because uh, it is not enough, for example, if you achieve a high position in the government, for example, you become a minister. And then when the government uh, propose uh, you as a candidate for the ICJ as a judge, uh, just because you are a former minister, you don't automatically get the vote because for such an important job as a judge, uh, they look, states look not only for your career in the government, but also in your academic uh, 
uh, career. So if you haven't published anything by the time you are uh, candidating for a judge at the ICJ, then there is, I think, almost a zero chance to be to be elected. Yes. And uh, because you know, even for being a judicial fellow, they ask you to publish something. Now imagine what is being required to be a judge at the ICJ. I think. <laughs> It is. Uh, it it goes without saying, basically, that uh, it it is truly needed, and uh, uh, and uh, I don't see and uh, any other way to to get the chance. And this is something that I really uh, want to in, uh, encourage everyone who studies international to publish a lot, because then you will. I mean, it, you don't need to be a judge, but when, when the time comes and the government proposes to you as a judge, then you are ready already because you already have published a number of articles in international journals and you have made your name well known already in the international community through your publications. Okay, now let's move on to the next yeah. questions. Uh, hi Bang, I want to ask a question. Is yeah. there any track or program from Comenlu that allows the employee there to work at ICJ? So, uh, there, well, uh, this is something that uh, I'm actually still working on because uh, be, uh, I did manage to go into the uh, ICJ because I was still doing my, at the same time, doing my SJD. So I did not have to ask for per separate permission from the office because I was still within my uh, permitted uh, uh, study assignment. And what if the question is what if uh, i have already let's say finished my sjd and then i return back to kemlu and suddenly i wanted to apply for the icj clerkship through my law school and i got accepted what is the uh, what is the uh, uh, the avenue for that so i think uh, the uh, foreign ministry really encourages uh, mm. everyone to enhance their capacity uh, development through, par, uh, through working in various international organizations. But admittedly, uh, as of now, the foreign ministry does not have the uh, ministerial regulation that actually allows you to do that. So currently, uh, the Indonesian foreign ministry is drafting a ministerial regulation that will allow uh, foreign ministry staff to to engage in uh, careers outside the foreign ministry for a particular time in order to enhance their capacities and uh, hopefully by the end of the year by the end of this year uh, the uh, we are able to finalize the draft uh, ministerial regulation and for those who will join later they will have no problem anymore okay yeah. uh, the last question yeah. Bang. Um, as a law student, is there a recommendation for a platform where we can publish our academic papers or journals? I think the uh, Indonesia Law Review is a, is a good platform. Uh, Indonesia Law uh, Or Indonesian Journal of International Law is a good platform to, uh, to start uh, writing and publishing articles. I don't know whether they are already in the, uh, they, whether they, these uh, journals are already accredited with the Scopus. But you know that that is a, a second matter for me personally. When you publish, there is the process how to conduct the research, how you write the articles is more important than the ranks of the journals themselves. You can always aim for a higher ranking journals later on, but the but learning how to write, learning how to pose a question, and learning what uh, to what how to research is very essential and i think publishing in the lower range journal first and then uh, gradually uh, through the experiences you can publish in a higher ranking journals later on but the most important thing is that you learn uh, from writing from conducting research and to get published okay yeah. um I think we still have time for yeah, few yeah, minutes sure. left. I think we still have, yeah. Yeah, uh, we can still answer some of the question here. Yeah. Uh, 
because some of the questions are repeated. So mm -hmm. um, let's see. Okay, uh, good afternoon, Kagulardi. I would okay. like to ask you in regards with your experience in judicial fellowship program, are there mm -hmm. some interesting aspects during your time there that you find beneficial to be applied in your career as a diplomat? Uh, there are many interesting aspects during my time there uh, that are very beneficial in apply um, in because now I'm working in the legal department. Of course, uh, how to conduct the research and how to write uh, a memo, for example, how to look at mm -hmm. cases. Uh, it gives me uh, an insider view or in insights of how international law is being uh, interpreted by the juries who are deciding on certain cases and not only from the judges that I learned but also from my colleagues because as I have said before they have outstanding uh, CVs and experiences already before joining the court and uh, I think uh, it is very useful but then again it is useful because now I'm working in the legal department uh, it might not be useful if I'm currently not working in the legal department. So uh, one thing is you cannot, uh, if you're working in the government, uh, you cannot really choose where you want to work, but you can always, uh, you can always make use of the time that you are doing to still pursue your passion. For example, uh, I'm just being very frank here. There are some departments in the ministries, not only in the foreign ministry, but any other ministries in Indonesia that are busier than the other. So let's say if you are being put in the department that are less busy, then you will have the chance to conduct a research, to write articles and to publish. And uh, this is uh, the way how how you can actually survive in working for the government. But going back to the question, uh, the experience of how uh, you have to deal with uh, why you are, why the case is being decided this way and why the court uh, is deciding this and not that, uh, it, it, gives you, it gives you a clear view of how international law stands as of today and also how to look into the uh, wordings of the judgment now for now if i look at the judgment like this i can understand okay why is this like this before i just take it like it is oh maybe 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 the judges meant this and there is a gradual uh, as I progressed through my first, uh, from my university, uh, when I was in undergrad, I just studied the judgment from the slides, PowerPoint presentation of the professors. I think all of us do yeah. that until today, I think. And when I did my LLM, I started reading the summary of the judgment. And when I did my SJD, I started reading the whole judgment. And the ICJ, I am compelled to read not only the judgment itself, but also the uh, memorials and the counter memorials of the, of the parties. And also the separate opinions and the dissenting opinions and the concurring opinions. And uh, it is a gradual process. Now I can understand international law better because I have read all those materials. So if you want to pursue international law, obviously not only to write, but you have to read as much as possible. Mm. There is no, there is no other way. <laughs> you, you cannot rely only on those slides uh, to get accepted at the ICJ. I think that's that's the key. Yeah, international law definitely requires for a card. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is a question. Um, as a law student that wants to pursue a career in ICJ, mm -hmm. which is more important, building my academic reputation, publishing journal, etc., mm -hmm. or expanding mm -hmm. my legal related experience, like internship I think it is not an either or option you can do both actually because like you can be doing an internship at UN uh, organization at the same time you can do after an 
an internship at UN organization usually only lasts for three months or six months at the maximum. And afterward, you can go to study LLM and then you can pursue your uh, educational knowledge even further. And uh, so these two can actually add up to your credentials and you don't need to pick uh, like one. Uh, and everyone, uh, I think at the ICJ, uh, my colleagues, uh, they have both actually. They have experience uh, internship in law firms or working for a certain government as a legal officer and then also uh, doing their JDs or their LLMs or even their PhDs. And so it will, you know, the more credentials that you collect, the more experiences, whether it is academic or whether it's uh, working experiences, it will just uh, enlarge your uh, probability to be to be selected to the court and one thing that i uh, want to uh, clarify here is that working as a judicial fellow is not a career it's a 10 months program it is not uh, even for the uh, associate legal officer it's it's a career but it's when you when we say something uh, when we talk about career we imagine something of a gradual uh, promotion yes. but when you are working at the ICJ, you work for the judge for two years and the maximum for four years, and then it's and then it's done. You have to find another job. So it's not really a career in the sense uh, when you are working for the government, for example. I started in 2010 and then I built up my, car my career being promoted to uh, a higher uh, rank, but it does not work that way in the ICJ. So my friends usually, they work in the IECJ and uh, after they finish their clerkship, uh, they work for public international law firms, which are also very, uh, uh, in, uh, which is uh, also an opportunity. It's a good opportunity for you to develop your skills and also knowledge international law because they are representing states before the ICJ. And uh, so it's a, uh, it's a combination of a, of a career, basically. So it's, it, there is no, uh, uh, we should not imagine that you work for the ICJ for your whole life, that, that's not possible. Unless well, you're working in the legal department actually, or in the administrative department. Okay, I think there are no new questions. Mm -hmm. So we will close our session today. Mm -hmm. uh, let okay. me just say thank you so much, Bang Gulardi, uh, who has shared as many information about uh, working as a clerk in ICJ, yeah. as well as an important advices on yeah. how to pursue uh, a career in international law. Mm -hmm. uh, allow me also to thank uh, all the audi audiences for joining us. We have also uh, many dialing from almost all provinces in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So the, we have 19 universities from Indonesia uh, registered for this webinar. Uh, one university abroad, uh, seven law student organization, as well as four institutions like OJK Pradi. Yeah. Uh, just to let you know, uh, we have more webinars to come, so please follow our social media update. Uh, our official Instagram is at Jasap Isil, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Isil Event, as we will upload this rerun uh, video today, uh, probably next week. Um, okay. Okay. Please stay tuned. Once again, thank you so much, Bang, and thank all you so much. for participating thank you. in this webinar. And goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Have Bye. a nice day. Bye.